America has had a lot of problems. And I'm not denying issues in our nation, but the United States of America is an exceptional nation whose people have always strived to form a more perfect union based upon our founding principles. Our family, our, our children, our grandchildren should be taught to take pride in our country, to respect our founding principles of liberty and equality, and to have a sense of American history that is both truthful and inspiring. And ye shall find knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. Hello, this is Pastor Bob Rogers from Louisville, Kentucky, and I want to welcome you today to Word Alive. On today's program, I'm going to be taking, to, taking you into our services where I share about the founding fathers and how their stand on the Word of God was absolutely the foundation of our country. It's going to be something that's going to be very powerful. But before I do, I want to send you a gift. This gift is entitled the United States Constitution, and I guarantee you that only about 15% of the people have ever read this. It tells not only the Constitution, but it tells some startling facts about the people who've written it. Then I have the book that I've also written entitled America, Fasting for Revival. I tell about every revival that's taken place here in America and how it began with prayer and fasting. And then thirdly, I have the American Patriot Bible. You can't only buy this Bible at all, but it is filled with page after page story after story about the history of America and you begin to see that uh, you cannot hide the power of the Word of God in the leaders almost every leader that rose up that was a, a voice in our nation they were led by the Holy Spirit I want to send all three of these to you for your generous gift and uh, for those who can send a uh, hundred dollars or more and I say or more because this bundle costs us a, a little under $20 just to mail it. But we want you to have this. We want to bless you with it. And you can be a blessing as well to help share the gospel and spread it all over the world. But today, I want to take you into our services. And I pray this will be a blessing to you. Take your Bible and hold it to the Lord. If you don't have a Bible, hold your hand up. But I want everyone to say with me out loud, this is the Word of God. This is God's plan for my life. It's a light unto my pathway. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a road map to heaven. I'm not going to get lost because I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. And I can be what it says I can be. In Jesus' name. As you remain standing, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Verse 13, Matthew 5, 13. Say, I love the book of Matthew. Come on, say it. I love the book of Matthew. Say, chapter 5, verse 13 is my favorite scripture. If you don't have a Bible, look on the pages of someone next to you, but I want to begin reading. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor wherewith shall it be salted it's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast down and trodden under the foot of men you're the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid and neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but put it but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Father, anoint your word with great power. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. God bless you. We're like a city set on a hill. A city that can't be hid. Those words were in a sermon that was preached by 
John Winthrop. He was a Puritan lawyer, yet he became a, a preacher as well. He actually was the first governor of Massachusetts and was for 20 years was a governor. But in 1630, as he was coming across on a ship here to America, he preached to the immigrants coming here on that ship, and he preached this sermon. And he says, as we make a covenant with God to honor him and to honor the word of the Lord, God will bless this land. He'll bless America, and America will be like a city set on a hill. It will be a beacon to all other nations for good and for righteousness and help spread the gospel around the world. And to be honest, that's exactly what happened and uh, happened here in America. God truly has used America for the good in the world. People come to this nation. Immigrants come from all over the world. They, they come here because they have an opportunity of a better life. They come here to give their children an opportunity to get an education. They come here because God has opened the door of a blessing here on the, our, our nation. God has used America, and we send 127,000 missionaries a year to preach the gospel in other countries. To give you an, a, um, an idea, the next country that sends the most missionaries is Brazil. And they send 34,000 missionaries. We send four times more missionaries than any other nation in the world. Then we spend almost $12 billion a year in missions. We give that so the gospel can go forth. And over the centuries, um, America has helped other nations in time of need. And when there has been uh, civil dis and when there's been famines and floods, America has helped finance the help to them. Now, America has had a lot of problems, and I'm not denying issues in our nation, but the United States of America is an exceptional nation whose people have always strived to form a more perfect union based upon our founding principles. Our family, our, our children, our grandchildren should be taught to take pride in our country, to respect our founding principles of liberty and equality, and to have a sense of American history that is both truthful and inspiring. And our founding fathers, which include George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Dr. Martin Luther King, were some of the greatest Americans to ever live and deserve to be honored as heroes and not to be debased and statues of them torn down. Our country has always followed the principle that we should not be taught to view one another according to race, gender, social status, or religion, but instead as individuals made in the image and likeness of God. So communism and socialism are a poisonous worldview and that breeds against success and breeds and speaks negativity. The history of these forms of government is first destroy and desecrate the history of a country. Secondly, it is to, it's built on greed to take from those who have and give to those who have not. And thirdly, socialism and communism both have an enemy, and that enemy is the church. And the very founding teachings uh, of the Bible are against this type of oppressive government. Today I want to share a little bit about God's divine plan for America and where this country has come from and how God has raised up men and women to make this country a godly nation and a country that is set up on a hill for the glory of God. One of the first men that God raised up was a man by the name of Christopher Columbus. You know his story, and I want you to turn your attention to our screens. On August 3, 1492, two fleets set sail from Spain's Port of Palos. They floated together down the Tinto River. One vessel was the final group of expelled Jews who would not renounce their faith as Jews and therefore were expelled from Spain. 
leading the other ships named the Penta, Nina, and Santa Maria, was a little-known explorer named Christopher Columbus. Unbeknownst to the King of Spain, Columbus was also a Jew in search of a better future. 100 years ago, Columbus was considered a world hero. Today, many are trying to defame him and belittle his reputation. However, the fact is God used Christopher Columbus to help establish this great land. His biographers tell us about him as being tall, imposing, good-natured, kind, daring, courageous, and a pious man. He observed the fasts of the church most faithfully, confessed, and took the sacrament often, read the Bible, and hated blasphemy and profane swearing. He sat out from Spain to accomplish something that no one else had ever accomplished and had ever returned alive. He made this statement. I know God has a plan for my life, and he's leading me on this voyage to find a new land for the glory of God. It will be a homeland for Jewish people and Christian nation, and help spread the gospel throughout the world. With God's help, we shall find this new world for the glory of God. Truly God was with Columbus. And shortly after midnight of December 24, the Santa Maria struck a coral reef off the northern shore of Hispaniola. The ship had to be abandoned, leaving Columbus with only the tiny Nina, the smallest of the three vessels. Columbus decided to plant a colony, using materials salvaged from the wrecked ship to build a small fort. He called it La Navidad, which is now Haiti because the shipwreck had occurred on Christmas Day. Leaving 39 volunteers to man the settlement, he turned the Nina toward Spain. Christopher Columbus, he came from Jewish descent, but he was a Christian. And when he came here, he was in hopes of finding a new homeland for the Jews. It's interesting, in those days, Spain was a superpower. They would be like, like America or like uh, Great Britain or France or the Soviet Union. They were a superpower militarily. But when they expelled the Jews and they came against the people of God, God took his hand off of Spain. And that anointing for a superpower nation fell upon America. And then over the next years, there were thousands and thousands of Jews that came over with those early explorers. When they reached this land, they, they didn't go back. The fact is, uh, just about 30 years ago, they discovered out from Santa Fe, New Mexico, out in a, a rural desert place, a rock, a rock that has been hidden for all these hundreds of years, and on it was engraved the Ten Commandments in ancient Hebrew. They believe that some of those early Jews who came over during the times of Columbus, they did that. I had a friend, he's dead now, by the name of Blackie Gonzalez. He was ordained by the governor to help build this as a monument for the state. And so God used Christopher Columbus and he claimed this land in the name of Jesus. And then God raised up another leader. His name was George Washington. George Washington grew up in the Church of England. The great-great-grandson of an Anglican pastor, he was baptized as an infant and remained active in the Anglican Church for the rest of his life. George Washington was an inspiring leader. Evidence suggests that not only was Washington protected and guided by the Lord, but he was aware that God had a greater purpose for America. In 1770, at the request of the governor of Virginia, George Washington led a small party in the Ohio wilderness to survey lands. While they camped in the woods near the Kanawha River, a small group of peaceful Indians entered the camp. Though surprised, Washington stood and greeted them politely. It became clear to Washington that the leader was an elderly man, the Grand Sachem, as he was called. And it soon became clear that the Grand Sachem, after hearing that Washington was in his territory, had traveled quite a distance to lay eyes on him. I have traveled the long and weary path that I might see 
a young warrior of the great battle. By the waters of Monongahela, we met the soldiers of the king beyond the seas who came to drive from the land my French brothers. Like a blind wolf, they walked into our trap. It was a day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forest. After pointing to Washington, the old man continued, I, who can bring the leaping squirrel from the top of the highest tree with a single shot, fired our these warriors more times than I have fingers. Our bullets killed his horses, knocked the war bond off his head, pierced his clothes. But that was in vain. A power mighter far than we shield him from harm. After a brief pause, the old Indian opened his mouth again to make his concluding remarks, or better said, his concluding prophecy. The Great Spirit protects that man and guides his destinies. He will become the chief of many nations, and a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty empire. I have come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. This all took place when Washington was only 23 years old. Washington would say, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation. For I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me and yet escaped unhurt. Although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. Indeed, the Lord has preserved me that I might be the leader of this great nation. With God's help, America shall serve God and will accomplish God's divine purpose here on this earth. In his will, written several months before his death in December 1799, George Washington left directions for the emancipation of all the slaves that he owned. He was the first Virginian to do so. He is considered the second greatest president in American history. The reason he is considered the second greatest president was because when democracy began, there was no other country in the world that had a government like this, by the people, for the people. And so they all had kings. And so many wanted George Washington to become a king, but he refused to. But instead, after his term, he retired to his farm and spent his days there on, uh, on his own farm. And then God began to raise up many other leaders. But perhaps the greatest of them all that's been our president has been Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is considered the greatest president that America has ever had. When he came into office, he was not a Christian, but through his writings, we understand he became a follower of Jesus during his first term as president. His speeches are filled with acknowledgments to God and for a country to serve its creator. Before he was ever sworn into the presidency, seven states seceded from the union. He led our country in the darkest hours of our nation. His most famous remarks were, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, 
but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise clap. Hallelujah. It's interesting to note that any nation who's ever had a civil war, it's taken over a hundred years or, or did they never rise again. But that was not so here in America. And I think one of the reasons is because this country experienced a great revival. It was during this time that Abraham Lincoln called for four fasts. And the northern states and the churches, they fasted that God would heal America and this war would end. On the south, they called for seven fasts. They almost had twice as many fasts. And uh, Abraham Lincoln said, don't worry about their fast. They're fasting for an unrighteous cause and God will not honor them. But yet God did honor by sending a revival to the south. And there were an estimated 250,000 of those soldiers came to Jesus in their meetings. And this is where the chaplaincy began in the north and in the south. It happened during the Civil War. And those uh, soldiers on both, both sides, many of them became Christians. But the south was devastated. Atlanta was burned to the ground. There was no more Vicksburg, Mississippi. Birmingham, there was just ashes along with Richmond, Virginia. But yet, within the next 30 years, these cities were rebuilt. Today, one of the strongest economies in all of this nation is in Atlanta, Georgia, in uh, Richmond, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And what happened? I believe God honored those prayers. God did not honor the unrighteous abomination of slavery, but God healed our land. God took that terrible disease out of our land of slavery. And God used Abraham Lincoln. Now, I want you to notice for a moment, the greatest founders and the greatest leaders, they based their lives and their principles on the word of God. But then it came to one of the great leaders as well. And that was none other than Dr. Martin Luther King. During the time in American history where there was great inequality among black Americans, God raised up a young black Baptist preacher, Dr. Martin Luther King. He was the leading force to bring equality to African Americans. He led the demonstration in Montgomery, Alabama when Rosa Parks refused to be moved to the back of the bus. He organized a peaceful demonstration for rights based upon the Bible. All Americans honor this great man of God who was a powerful leader and was assassinated by enemies of God and of righteousness. His most famous words were given in his speech in Washington, D.C. in 1963. I have a dream. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims' pride, from every mountainside, 
let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the crevaceous slopes of California. But not only you know, some of you, you come from a family, and you had a praying grandmother, you had a praying mother. Uh, you had uh, situations in your family, and without the prayer of your, your family, where would you be today? Some of you'd be dead, some of you'd be in jail. But through prayer, it changed everything. Well, that's the story of America. That's the story of this land that was demonized. Uh, the Indians that came here, they, uh, the Mohawks, that means meat eaters, they were cannibals. These were vicious people. And the people who came to this land were people who were godly people, and they were able to settle this land. And America became a voice for God. Today, I have something that you really need. It's called the Constitution of the United States. Read it. And also the book entitled Fasting for Revival. It tells the history of revival. And it'll come to your family if you'll pray and fast. And thirdly, I have the Patriot Bible. And this tells the history of our country in it, along with the Word of God. It uh, tells leaders and, and how they prayed and the miracles that happened. It tells about, it tells about uh, George Washington. And the prophetic word that came from an Indian chief, how he had shot uh, uh, Washington five times, how he had shot two of his horses out from underneath him, but he couldn't be, he, be killed. And this Indian came and gave a prophetic word over George Washington. It shows how God in his divine will protected that man to become the first president of this nation. I want to send all these three to you for your generous gift. Of $100 or more, and I say or more because some of you could send 200 some of you could send $150. Uh, the mailing uh, cost us just a little under $20. But we want you to have this and be a blessing. The information, how you receive it, is right there on the screen. So I look forward to hearing from you. Well, thanks for viewing today, and uh, we'll be back next week at the same time. God will direct you. The Bible says, be ye not unwise, but understanding. Understand what the will of the Lord is. If we will seek Him, God will show us how to be blessed. God will break off of us whatever the devil has put on us in Jesus' name. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.